Well, it gets to the whole idea we were talking about private minds and, and even the whole thing of part of the mother concept is that there's a responsibility for the children. And somehow yeah. it can seem even stronger when you're younger, where it seems like, yes, I'm responsible <laughs> for my five year old's behavior. Well, yes, I'm. I'm kind of responsible for my 14 year old behavior or 18 years old and then it seems like it crosses over but there still could be remnants of I'm still responsible for this other human being's behavior and right. decisions or too it, it gets mm, or well being or well being yes and knowing that she's having a hard oh. time getting her money to stretch far enough too so you're concerned about her financial yeah, I mean, probably the bottom line comes down to, I think, well, she's moving in with me, and so therefore, it will probably <laughs> end up being my problem. <laughs> well, yeah. there's certainly one out yeah. of projected out into the future in some place. Nothing that's happening right now that I'm afraid of. Like the fear of the future. Yeah, thinking, well, it could be, you know, it's like borrowing trouble, saying, well, you know, if this, this, and this happens, well, then this could happen too. And, uh, well, again, it gets back to that thing we were talking about early on about the mind thinks it knows. I mean, even thinking you know what somebody else's decision making process is, or thinking you know what someone else's um, <coughs> motivations are for doing things, it, it also gets back into a little bit of specialist in the sense that it, it doesn't, you know, if the man down the street buys a geo and chooses to do this or that with it, or you see on TV a troubleshooter report on somebody with a geo, it's like, oh well, that's yeah. not my daughter <laughs> that we're talking <laughs> about that. here, and those are self-concept issues, and once again, we'll, you know, you come from the point that everybody who believes they're here in this world has a deceived mind. Everyone who seems to have come to this world has forgotten their true identity. And it seems like as you go along and you learn the ways of the world that you become a competent, mature adult that can figure things mm -hmm. out pretty well. As a matter of fact, thank you very much. It's kind of <laughs> right. a feeling like that. And and when you really start to move along the spiritual path, you start to see how that more and more is not the case. That the mind thinks it knows, even in some cases, what would be best. Well, one of the lessons in the workbook, I think it's lesson 24, is I do not perceive my own best interest. So if I can't perceive my own best interest, how can I perceive <laughs> my brother? Anybody else. Or anybody else. <laughs> how can I perceive my brother? It's yeah. very humble. It's a real state of humility when you come. Now, of course, from a place of defenselessness and a place of peace, you may be guided to make suggestions. And a lot of times parents are guided with children, with employers, employees, neighbors. You know, if you're guided to make a suggestion, that's one thing. It's the string. It's when it's seen more as advice that I would very strongly <laughs> urge you to take into strong consideration here. Like that, you can see where here come those hooks and strings, yeah. that there's obviously expectations, but... And that my happiness depends on you accepting yeah. the advice that I'm giving you. Yeah. And if your daughter seems to be even coming over here and possibly even moving in, then this is going to be a great teaching learning opportunity yeah. to let go of all those strings. And to still, it's not like we're saying, oh, become a good doormat, you know, where you become totally passive. <laughs> or cut her off. Or you cut her off or any of those things. But it, it really is coming to clarity of mind and, and coming to more and more just bring up the question of what is this for? What value do you see it? I mean, if you can point people in the direction of even beginning to ask some of those questions, that can be really helpful. It's just like a sorting out of priorities that we all have to go through. Do we value the material things of the world more, or do we value the attitude of love and acceptance? Well, it seems like there are certain cases, specifically a lot of times with family or significant other relationships, where there seems to be a lot of investment in what the partner 
or what the other person is thinking, what they're saying, what they're doing. And it, but it seems like if money means nothing, then then what? What? Why do people even become concerned? I guess it's an ego thing. The why you think that's an important issue? Because when I think about it that way, I think, well, why should? I mean, what difference does it make whether she brings the car or doesn't bring the car? If money is nothing. Well, let's look at money for a minute because, I mean, I know that as we go along, that would be one of the things that for most people that's on their mind in some way, shape, or form that comes up, the financial. And the Course is teaching, again, that, that everything in this world is just symbolic. It stands for something. And that the deceived mind has given meaning to everything that it perceives. You know, some people see a, a mountain view or a sunset and they just want to stay there and they say, this is breathtaking. It takes my breath away. And someone else can say, hey, Mom, I want to go down and ride my motorcycle. Can we leave? No. <laughs> it's not taking my breath away. <laughs> you know, I'm not perceiving the same thing you are. And so everybody seems to have a different perception. And that's based on the value or the meaning that it's giving us. Some people with money, it seems to be a real, real big issue. And for other people, it seems to be less of an issue, so it's all those gradations. But if everything's symbolic, and the mind has given meaning to it, the reason that money seems to even have more of a charge on it than a lot of other things, and it seems to be so important, is, is that it's a symbol that's interchangeable for a lot of the other symbols. It's like, if we talked about the Holy Spirit or love, it's like the universal language of the mind. We could say the universal language, so to speak, of the world is money, because it's so exchangeable for the other symbols, for the, for the food symbol, for mm -hmm. the clothing, the shelter symbol, for the um, activities and all the, the different distractions and things that seem to go on that seem to help alleviate a lot of the problems. And that's why we were talking earlier how money seems to, um, if, you, if you seem to have lack and scarcity and deprivation, money seems to have a way <laughs> of answering lack, deprivation, and scarcity. And it, of course, if it's a belief in the mind and, and you use money to have, make it go away, then of course the belief's still there if you, until the belief gets questioned and you still perceive yourself as a person with needs, then you still have to keep using the magic of the money to kind of keep solving it. So again, it's very helpful to think of it, wow, if I keep going into this and, and examining my beliefs in lack, my beliefs in scarcity, if, you know, your daughter would move in with you and there would be this thing about an extra $800 or this or that, if you really trace it down, you can start to say, well, I, I may need that $800 for, you know, and you can start naming some things. You can see that it relates again to if you trace it down again to the body, that bodies are the things in this world that seem to have needs. Yeah. And they seem to, to maintain them in a sense of a basic way seems to require money or resources. And then beyond the basics, you know, there's like, well, I just don't want to survive. <laughs> I, want to, I want to enjoy. And it seems like there's that whole layer on top of that. But they all can get traced back to the body. What the Course is saying is, is that the lacks and the scarcities and the needs are really in the mind, not in the body. I think it, it gets projected to the body. And Jesus is such a good model again. You know, he, he would say, you know, I am the bread of life. Kind of a, a good symbol that, you know, you know, eat of my teachings and you'll come to an everlasting peace and, and happiness that where you don't have all these needs. You know, I am the the water, you know, he has the living water with the Holy Spirit with him, and if you drink of me, then you'll never drink again. So it's it's just starting to loosen and to just even to begin to question one's belief system, I think is a is a movement towards coming to a clarity where you moment by moment, situation by situation, the Holy Spirit can speak through you and address <coughs> the situation. It never is about um, um, the specifics. In other words, it can seem like a big deal whether I loan somebody some money or don't. 
whether I um, do something or don't do it when, when really the court the car or not. Yeah, or whether the outcome is that she brings it or not. Those are two different outcomes. And again, the, the course is very empowering. It says your perception is your choice. You know, it's, it's not, it's how you look upon the situation. It's not the specific outcome that would bring it. So in this case, is it really Brenda that I should be looking at rather than the car and seeing what my feelings are about her? You know, do you, do you project your feelings? Like, am I projecting feelings about her onto the car and making it seem like the car is the issue when really it's, it's our relationship that, that could be the issue? You could talk about that. that. that screen, though. Yeah, but either one yeah. would both be on the screen. It would be, again, <coughs> looking at the meaning, just the meaning you're ascribing to the situation and, yeah. and taking a look in that way. Because it can seem that way in relationships a lot of times, like it's never about bickering and arguing about the little things that seem to be happening, but it's it's about something much deeper. Yeah. You know, when you mention that, <coughs> Linda, you know, like I could very easily see and trace it all back because that's your thing with her mm -hmm. heart. And it's probably the same way with me and my son in this bathroom thing. Very simple. But I think it's when we, see, because our ego selves, that self gets threatened in some sort of way. I guess in your case, maybe she's not listening to your good it's advice. Yeah. <laughs> and in my case, he's not learning the good lessons that this father is teaching him. So he's sort of denying this self, you know. And as long as I got this self to deny, I'll suffer and I'll have pain. And, you know, so, you know. That's what I have to get rid of, that self that can be hurt, that can suffer. And um, again, move towards who I really am, and that's that spiritual being or that mind uh, where none of that exists. But it's so hard when you've invested so much in this self. You know, I spent all my life developing this person called Ron Clark, you know, <laughs> and you just don't want to give it up. And I think that's the struggle, and that's the pain for me with my son, is he's saying, Dad, you don't amount to much because I'm going to do what I want to do. And yeah. you know, it's like, oh, how can he do that to me, you know? No. And, you know and that's probably the same thing, yeah, I mean... Boy, I sure did teach her better yeah. than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and until we get rid of that self that get hurt, that, um, and the ego will always put that self up there for that to happen because, again, he wants you on that treadmill, so to speak. Uh-huh. Yeah. With clarity, how old is your son? Oh, that doesn't clean the bathroom. Okay, just give me a point of reference. Yeah, <laughs> not, not the real. And then it makes a difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah it really does. It, it may seem like it would make a difference, but what we're really getting at is if the son was, well, three, was four. Was this four. is an age appropriate <laughs> request. Yeah, it seems like an age appropriate request, but once again, yeah. those expectations yeah. that are tied in, and what we're talking about is coming to a clarity where you. You don't. You can come to such a clarity and such a sense of being totally reliant on the Holy Spirit that you don't make all these demands yeah. and expectations on other people, so that unless they change or unless they live up to these standards, that you know the anger seems justified. Because mm -hmm. the world has taught us that there are certain things where anger is justified, and the teachings of the Course and the teachings of Jesus are that anger is never justified. But we're not talking anger here, are we? Or it's irritation. We could, okay. When we talk about anger or fear, where again, Jesus makes the thing, he says, there are no small upsets. That any upset, even annoyance, even a mire's irritation is, is taking me away from peace. So if there's something in there that I'm even mildly annoyed about, then that's worth taking a look at. I'm worth looking <laughs> at my mind is even for that. So well, at this stage, you can imagine, this could take the rest of my life just looking at every little annoyance. <laughs> that way. But again, bottom line is, though, even though they're every little one on the surface and out there on the screen, there's only one. Right. Yeah. They yeah. all start. Yeah, they, they get portrayed, but it, when well, you come back. You're looking at various fractures, yeah. but they're yeah. all pointing back 